When we label anything on the ECG as ventricular, these are beats or impulses that originate in the bundle branches, the Purkinje fibers, or even the muscle cells of the ventricles. All of these beats or rhythms will produce wide and abnormal QRS complexes because the electricity is bypassing the normal pathways of conduction, moving in different directions, and moving more slowly than with our normal conduction. These can occur as single beats, in pairs or runs, rhythmically in a repeating pattern, or as an entire rhythm on the ECG tracing. I'll start by describing isolated ventricular beats. And just as we describe PACs and PJCs, we describe early beats coming from the ventricles as premature ventricular complexes, or PVCs. I will cover these in some detail because they're very common. In fact, PVCs are the most common of all the dysrhythmias you will see, and they usually have minimal clinical significance, but they may be a clue to serious cardiac pathology. There are a few key characteristics of PVCs that make them easy to recognize. First, of course, is that they happen early, that is, before the next expected sinus beat. Second, there will be no P wave present, or if there is a P wave, it's not associated with the QRS. Third, the QRS will be wide. And finally, that QRS will look different than the normal QRS complexes for that patient, often moving in the opposite direction from the baseline. Another telltale clue that you are looking at a ventricular beat is that the T wave typically travels in the opposite direction of the QRS. It isn't really surprising that when you have a big, ugly depolarization in one direction, that you're likely to see a big and equally ugly repolarization moving opposite that. This feature is often clearly visible in PVCs, as well as in most ventricular rhythms. PVCs can be caused by a variety of things, many of which are similar to the causes of PACs, such as stress, anxiety, overstimulation, electrolyte imbalance, or cardiac disease. PVCs are often a clue of myocardial irritability and are often the result of general hypoxia or localized ischemia. It's also important to recognize that PVCs are extremely common in post-MI patients. In fact, approximately 80% of all MI patients will develop chronic PVCs. PVCs are usually followed on the ECG by a compensatory pause because they've prevented the next normal impulse from transmitting through to the ventricles. They typically have no impact on the SA node, so it continues to fire, and subsequent impulses move through the AV node and to the ventricles in a normal fashion. The presence of PVCs will result in an overall irregular rhythm, but the underlying rhythm is often clearly visible. PVCs may actually produce a palpable pulse, but they usually do not. It is good practice to feel the pulse as you assess the ECG to determine whether the early beats are perfusing, as that has a significant impact on the patient's actual pulse rate, which may not match the heart rate on the monitor. Occasional PVCs are generally tolerated very well, but represent a more serious problem as they increase in frequency and variety. That's why it's relevant to label the details that we see with PVCs. We identify the underlying rhythm and then add the details that describe how frequent the PVCs are happening and whether or not we think they are coming from multiple sites. If they all look about the same, we assume they are coming from a single site and we call them unifocal, meaning one focus. If the PVCs show up with two or more different appearances, we assume they are coming from multiple points of origin and we label them multifocal. To identify the frequency of the PVCs, we can label them as occasional if they occur less than six times per minute, or frequent if they occur more than that. Just like we labeled our other early beats, if every other beat is a PVC, we call that ventricular bigeminy. If every third beat is a PVC, we call that ventricular trigeminy. If we see two PVCs in succession without a normal beat in between, we call that a couplet of PVCs. And if we see three or more in a row, we must identify that as its own ventricular rhythm. Clinically, PVCs typically require no intervention 
but they can be significant if they happen frequently enough to lower cardiac output. Multifocal PVCs are more serious than unifocal PVCs because they reflect a greater area of irritability in the ventricles and a greater risk of progressing to a lethal rhythm. More frequent PVCs also increase the chance of an R on T phenomenon occurring where the early ventricular impulse lands directly on the vulnerable repolarization phase and could result in VTAC or even VFib. This rhythm is one in which three or more ventricular beats arise in sequence at a rate greater than 100 beats per minute. It originates from an extremely irritable area in the ventricle, it may or may not generate a pulse, and the presence or absence of a pulse determines our options for interventions. Pulseless VTAC is a lethal rhythm and is treated the same as VFib. Even when it produces a pulse, in VTAC the rapid rate results in decreased filling time and the contractions produced are less organized and produce a very poor cardiac output that in most cases will sustain a patient for only a short time. This rhythm must be managed quickly and aggressively before it deteriorates into either pulseless VTAC or VFib. In VTAC, we will usually see a regular rhythm at a rate typically between 150 and 250, wide QRS complexes, and no visible P waves. If there are any P waves seen, they have no association to the QRS complexes, so there is no PR interval to measure. As I mentioned earlier, it is also common to note that the T wave extends dramatically in the opposite direction from the QRS. In polymorphic VTAC, the origin of the rhythm is coming from more than one site in the ventricles. In this case, the rhythm may be irregular and the QRS complexes may vary in appearance. One specific type of polymorphic VTAC is known as torsade de poids or simply torsades if you prefer to skip the French pronunciation. In this rhythm, you will see an unmistakable pattern of the QRS amplitude increasing and decreasing across the ECG tracing. The other ventricular rhythms you should be familiar with are all indicative of serious cardiac dysfunction and are most likely seen in a patient in cardiac arrest. If you remember that the intrinsic firing rate of ventricular cells is about 15 to 40, then you'll recognize that a rhythm at that rate with wide and ugly QRS complexes would be simply labeled a ventricular rhythm. If that ventricular rhythm is faster than we expect, but less than 100, we call it an accelerated ventricular rhythm. And if we believe it is originating in the ventricles and is even slower than the intrinsic rate, we call it an idioventricular rhythm or an agonal rhythm. To summarize, we label things as ventricular if the QRS is wide and bizarre looking and there's no P wave associated with the QRS. We identify the underlying rhythm and then use qualifiers to describe ectopic ventricular beats. They can be unifocal, multifocal, couplets, bigeminy, trigeminy, and they may occur occasionally or they may happen frequently. If the rhythm itself is generated from the ventricles, we identify it specifically based on the rate. Greater than 100 is VTAC, although it's rare to see ventricular tachycardia at a rate less than 150. 40 to 99 would be called an accelerated ventricular rhythm. At a rate of 15 to 40, we simply label it as a ventricular rhythm. And anything less than 15 is described as agonal or idioventricular. What are the clinical implications? PVCs are incredibly common and generally well tolerated. Treatment, if it is needed at all, is focused on reducing hypoxia or ischemia and treating underlying problems. Ventricular rhythms, on the other hand, are an immediate life threat. If they're already pulseless, VTAC is a shockable rhythm and needs defibrillation as quickly as we can deliver it. In VTAC with a pulse, we must act quickly with either cardioversion or medication to correct the rhythm or it is likely to deteriorate rapidly. Slow ventricular rhythms without a pulse are an ominous finding and are unlikely to respond to resuscitation.